Hey everybody, uh, let's get started. So this is a workshop, for those of you who aren't familiar, that means we get to talk and you don't, um, and that's because it's not a formal meeting, we're just doing our planning for the next one. Um, and uh, I see a crew here, uh, I see uh, Jeff, Amber, Pam, Dan, Lee, do we have any council members online? You do. What, would you announce yeah. yourselves? Yeah, Molly Rhodes here. Paloma Wake here. Okay, hey everybody, so we have a full house. The city attorney is in person, the city administrator is in person. Is there anyone else online? Okay, no. let's get started. Um, first one is an agreement uh, with Axon Enterprise for police department equipment and software. I guess, Chief, you and maybe Nick are gonna talk us through that? Sure. Thank you. Great to see you all again. You too. Good to be seen. Huh? Good to be seen. <laughs> Is it? All right. So in 2018, as you guys may be aware, because um, we've talked about it sometime, uh, the City of Beacon Police Department was one of the first agencies in Dutchess County to fully embrace the use of body-worn cameras for its members. Cameras have proven very useful uh, to the department in ensuring professional standards, completing accurate reports, and aiding in criminal prosecutions. At the time of the adoption, the body worn camera uh, industry was basically in its infancy. And the department selected a system which was well regarded at the time and highly affordable. As technology has progressed since that time, this very basic system uh, did not, and it's been eclipsed by many of its competitors. Additionally, the cameras themselves have proven over the course of two generations to be kind of fragile and relatively unreliable. Their much lower cost, however, kept them as a uh, value proposition, and we've maintained that same platform. On August 26, we were informed by our current vendor and manufacturer that they had left the law enforcement body-worn camera industry and that they would no longer be able to supply, warranty, or repair our cameras. This has put us in a bit of a crunch because they break so often that if we don't replace them soon, will basically be out of the camera uh, uh, program, you know, by six months from now. Um, Axon is a company which supplies a full suite of law enforcement technologies. They're currently and we're very likely to remain the leader in the industry. Um, at this point, they really only have one other notable competitor. They're the supplier for NYPD, the New York State Police, and nearly all police departments in Dutchess County, and provide evidence support technology for our district attorney's office. Their cameras are currently considered to be the best on the market and their back-end software is far superior to what we use now. Where our current system just creates a simple MP4 play, uh, file which is only searchable by the officer and date, their system provides many more search options, as well as the ability to prepare video for release um, with redaction that happens virtually automatically compared to the many hours that we would have to spend with our current technology doing this manually. Um, it also has the ability to seamlessly integrate with the district attorney's office's uh, evidence software. And additionally, they actually came in lower than their only real competitor in the market right now, and they are on OGS contract. In addition to the body cameras, Axon's are currently supplier for uh, less lethal electronic control weapons. They're commonly referred to as tasers, but that's kind of like a Kleenex name. Um, during our budget workshop, we discussed the fact that we're currently due for replacement for our ECWs and that the replacement has already been budgeted for in the 2025 proposal. Finally, Axon provides software which allows the department to receive digital video from any source and essentially wraps it in an MP4 file, allowing it to be played without having to download individual media players. Um, get into the weeds a little bit, this is a little bit precarious. So a lot of people have a lot of different surveillance camera systems now um, for their businesses and so on and so forth. They're pretty affordable. But in order to play some of their videos, you have to download players that are questionable in their security. Um, they come from foreign markets, and, and they can't really always be relied upon to not be uh, prone to viruses. Um, Axon offers a technology that allows you to just take the file and wrap it in MP4 and play it without downloading those questionable players. This would be able to uh, significantly enhance our investigation efforts and our ability to distribute evidence to prosecutors and defense attorneys. In order to maximize our return on investment, Axon offers to bundle these technologies at a reduced cost. 
Bundling would allow us to save approximately $100,000 over the course of a 60-month contract. Um, fortunately, the department previously secured a technology grant for approximately $135,000 from New York State. This funding can only be used for law enforcement technology purposes, and Axon has agreed to a payment structure that allows us to use the grant money up front and to pay for the cameras, <coughs> to pay for the cameras and to pay for the remaining video software and um, electronic control weapons in subsequent years. Um, that way, the amount we've budgeted for in 2025 doesn't have to change, and then going forward, we would pay that same amount in addition to approximately a little over four, excuse me, a little under 14,000 for the uh, software that I was talking about, which would allow us to wrap those videos in those MP4 files. You guys have any questions? I have two. So I note in your memo, um, it, there's a, a, a sentence about integrating with the district attorney's office's evidence management system and uses cloud-based storage. Can yes. you clarify if we're talking about cloud-based storage that is um, sourced by Axon, or is that the district attorney's cloud-based storage? It's Axon's cloud-based storage. Okay. Um, and I appreciate that they have technology that supports privacy, like the blurring of faces. Do you know if their search capabilities use um, any kind of machine learning or AI? Yes, they do. They do. And have we reviewed what kind of data they use to feed those models? Uh, we haven't. I mean, to be honest, it's not like you, you don't use their AI technology for the purpose of creating evidence. Um, you, know, you can use it to say, search for an action um, or search for like keywords if you're searching the video. So it's really more on the back end of, of managing our own cameras. You're not using it to like search for other people's evidence. Yeah, um, I understand it's not our models and that there may be limited use, but I always have concern about the data that drives those kind of machine learning technologies. Um, and I do think it's somewhat important to understand how they're sourcing it. Um, I don't think it necessarily means that we shouldn't do business with them. I think it would just be helpful for us to understand how they drive those, that decision making in their search. Is there specific um, concerns as far as the use of it that you have that I could answer? Not necessarily in the terms of the use of it. It's more how they are sourcing data to inform their models. So what kind of demographic information are they using and what is the source of that information? Just making sure that it's aligned to best practices. Are they, are they using any external information? Well, they're using AI and machine learning in their search, and those are models. No, 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 but it, isn't it a search of the video? Or is it a search uh, something else at some other source? It's something that speeds your ability to search your video, and it speeds yeah. your ability to, say, blur faces, right? You, you kind of can't blur faces without using that kind of technology because you need technology that can recognize faces. The only alternative is, is that like you could do what we do now, which is kind of take hours of an individual sitting there with a system where you actually break it up frame by frame and drop a blur onto each frame as the face moves throughout the frame. I guess maybe another way to share, again, I'm not necessarily saying that we shouldn't do biz with, business with them. I think this is just something that we have to be attentive to. Um, an, another way to position that maybe, are they taking our videos and using that in their machine learning? And then how are they actually encrypting and anonymizing that data so that it can't be pulled back to an individual? Maybe that's a better way to highlight what the concern is. I think that would be my concern with AI as well, is if they're using images of beaconites for training data yeah. for the AI model. Thank you, that's kind of exactly where I'm going. What is the underlying source of how this is all derived and how do we make sure that the data the, the data protection is to the standards that we would expect for our citizens, our community members. You know, I'm glad we're using the, the term of art AI, but the, the issue is not the technology that's being applied, the issue is what's the data. Right? Yes. And so the question would be, um, are we only looking at our own data from our cameras? And then the similar question that I think one of them asked is, is any of our data being used for anything else? Right, doesn't matter the technology. That's the question. Gotcha. Okay. And I think the third question in there is if the answer to that first question is that 
um, data outside of our own cameras is being used? Where is that being sourced from? Is that correct from yeah. anyone else? Yeah, it's always a data question. It's Again, it's not the technique. It doesn't matter. The question is, what are the data sources that are of use here? My understanding was it's, there are cameras, there are video, and we have tools that help us go through our data. That sounds fine. I got no issue with that. And as someone said, is our data being used elsewhere or is outside data being used in, in which case, tell us how, right? That's how you understand the problem. Thanks. Thank you. I just wanted to double check money-wise. I wasn't fully following the, you've kind of worked it out with the grant that's there for 135,000. You've kind of worked out what the annual costs will be over the five years. Is that for the ECWs and for the video software? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so we're paying the lump sum to actually get the cameras. Um, the ECWs, that's part of what we already approved in the in the, in the well, budget. actually, excuse me, perhaps you didn't already approve it, yeah. but what was already in the budget um, mm -hmm. that we already talked about about what was in the budget, that's a contract, so that, that would be a recurring cost uh, annually, and then there would be a recurring cost for that um, software, software. That, like I said, that kind of wraps the videos in that MP4 file. That's just shy of the 14000 Right. And is that included in the budget now? I did not look at that. In the proposed budget. In the proposed budget. It doesn't hit until 2026, the way they wrote oh, the that structure. Does, they oh, knew, okay. So we kind of, we had our budget process kind of pretty far along when we got kind of hit with this, hey, you've got to find a new body camera vendor and you got to do it kind of quick. Um, so they worked with us kind of setting aside so that we didn't have to change the 2025 budget. Okay. All right. And so the... It's not a set amount each year, though. Like just next year, it's going to be the fourteenth thousand, or is that going to be the five-year contract? Is going to be that dollar amount? So next year would be the seventeen thousand that we already talked the about. The seventeen thousand yeah. six eighty-two yep. plus the thirteen nine sixty. No. no, for twenty twenty-five, it'll just be the seventeen six eighty-two. Correct. Yeah. Right, because they knew we had already worked that out. It'll yeah. be the six seventeen six eighty-two plus thirteen nine sixty-two, and that'll go on for. For the remainder of the contract. Four more years. Yeah. Four more years. Yes. Because the remaining 60 months, that's going to start January 1st, 2025. We'll start the 60 months. Actually, as soon as we sign, we'll start the 60 months. Okay. So it could be in a week and a day or so or a week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everybody good? Mm hmm All right. Um, quick question. To answer that question, would you like me to kind of like forward you a reply in email? How do we want to go forward with that? So, so the one about data? Yep. So um, I think all we need to hear is that um, the, any external data used is, you know, for our purposes, doesn't matter where it's sourced, quite frankly, um, and then any of our data is not used externally. Right, because then all we're doing is we're, you know, arraying data for our purposes and not for others. And if there's some kind of a contract that we're signing, you know, I'd defer to Nick and Chris on if there's contractual language about making sure that the data that we're providing to this company is only used for the specific purposes that, um, that we've agreed to. But um, I think the uh, council is saying, let's go ahead, but do answer those questions for us. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. You're still up. Next one is the appointment of uh, three uh, police officers to police detective. That's uh, Ryan, Kevin, and Samantha. Want yes. To tell us about that. So as we've discussed previously, um, with the promotions, we had vacancies in the detective division. What we usually do then is assign patrol officers there, um, kind of on a trial basis. It's like a little bit of a probationary period, see how they work out, see how they like the position. Um, we've actually had people we put in there as officers to elect to go back to patrol. Um, so we did put three people there when we made our promotions earlier in the year. Um, the first one is Officer Ryan Sambles. He is a U.S. Army veteran and began with the department in 2018 and was hired while in the Dutchess Police Academy as a part-time deputy sheriff. 
He worked diligently in patrol and was assigned as a bike patrol officer when available. Since being assigned to the detective division, he's already successfully completed uh, interview and interrogation school and crime scene technician school, two major courses our detectives are required to attend. Uh, the next person we put back there was Officer Kevin Sequist. He was hired in September of 2018. During his time as a patrol officer, he's also served as a Department of Firearms instructor and armor, and has largely been responsible for organization and administration of that training program, which includes responsibility for large portions of department property. As a result of excelling in that role, he was selected and completed training for assignment as the department's evidence custodian, which makes him responsible for maintaining all of the evidence in the department's custody, and he's been doing a fantastic job with that so far. And then the final officer that we assigned was Officer Samantha Milani. She was hired in uh, April 2020. While assigned to patrol, she was selected to become a certified as a police general topics instructor and then received specialized certification as a physical fitness instructor, a position required for the department's evaluation of new candidates in the civil service physical agility test. Additionally, she's already completed the FBI basic and crime scene photography classes, and she actually just completed a course on conducting police background investigations. Okay, and they're currently already sworn officers. They've been serving in the detective role, and now you're proposing we appoint them to the position of detective. Yes. Okay. Any questions or issues? Um, I have one thing just to call out. I think, Chief, you put this in the packet, but because they're already serving it as detectives, this won't further put any pressure on officers who are on ships is that correct because they're already serving as as detectives? that's correct that's correct we have a contractual minimum assignment to our detective division as well um, but they've already been there does this put us at that minimum yes okay i mean technically we were at the minimum because they were assigned as patrolmen but and now it's official <laughs> okay. but now that they've done a good job and they want the position we'd like to actually give it to them permanently all right and just because it's the day after Veterans Day, I'll thank Officer Samuels for his service. And <coughs> Pass that that's on. all. Um, <clears throat> any update on our hiring efforts? We are into the 80s on the current list. Um, we're actually doing a PT test for some candidates who don't have a PT test that took the previous test. Um, so there's 20 or so candidates. We're going to be doing that with the Sheriff's Office. Um, and then we do have a NYPD candidate who is scheduled for a polygraph on the 14th and a, psycho a psychological exam as long as he passes the polygraph um, around the 20th. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Very good. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Um, next one, Chris, you got. This is appointing Samantha Britton to... Uh, recreation supervisor yes so we have an opening in our recreation department for recreation supervisor this is to replace the uh, position that Nate Smith left when he took the um, director position up in the town of Poughkeepsie uh, Samantha Britton has been in the orbit of our department since 2017 she uh, served on helping us with development of curriculum for the after-school program since 2017 She's also worked with Cornell Cooperative on the Green Team Program in three different roles. Um, so she's very familiar to us. We did go through a formal interview process and considered two other candidates who both um, also had the qualifications and we are confident that Sam would be the best in this position. So we're proposing to hire her next week and try to backfill that position. Is this a civil service um, position? And if so, has, has um, Samantha already passed the, the exam? It's not a testable position. Ah, okay. So some of them um, are competitive and some are non-competitive. I'm not clear of uh, that. That's a Sarah question, and I can get back to you okay. on that. I don't have I don't, any objection. I'm just from a logistics a perspective position. interested in if there's like additional steps required. Thanks. No, it's a, a good question. I, I never kind of thought about that problem so thank you well it's a it's a question for I, I I have the highest confidence Samantha I know her I think she'd be great in this role but I know of one person who said that they were looking into the job and then they were told that they needed to take a civil service test they should have had taken a civil service test 
Um, there, was, so. there was no test, there was no list in civil service for this mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and I'd be glad to talk to you offline about who that might be. Um, <clears throat> I will note the last time I saw Samantha, um, uh, Chris and she and I were all giving blood. Uh, actually, there's a blood drive. We were donating blood. We weren't just <laughs> giving out <laughs> yeah, blood. Yeah, okay. Um, there's uh, actually another blood drive at the recreation, at the community center on West Center Street this Wednesday. We'll be and, giving out our blood again. <laughs> and I won't be surprised if I see Samantha there as well. So. And that's all I got. All right. These are always interesting. <laughs> all right. The next one is appointing Peter Del Delfico uh, to the position of head auto mechanic. Yes. So we are anticipating the um, retirement of Steve Bechtel, who's been with the city for more than 30 years and currently serves as the head automotive mechanic. Um, Pete Delfico has been with our department for 22 years, he is a very skillful mechanic who is one of the few people in our staff who can work on diesel um, engines. And we have no hesitation in, again, Steve, Steve was great, but um, really he, he has been under Steve for many, many years. So we'll be um, looking to fill that position for Steve and have some overlap before Steve leaves in January, and then we'll be back filling uh, two other positions. So one, we have a, a third mechanic who will probably move up and take Pete's current position and then we'll have an opening for that. So we have three mechanics in highway and this is the highest position in that sub-department. Okay. Any questions, issues? All right. Uh, <coughs> so let's go on to the next one. The next one is a um, request for a certificate of occupancy for 248 so Tyronda. Mayor, I apologize for the interruption, but I'm advised that their, um, one of their team representatives is running late, so they've asked if you could move to the next item while they wait for that individual oh, sure. to arrive. Not a problem. Any issues with the council doing that? No. Hearing none. Uh, so let's do the proposed 2025 budget. Uh, Chris, Nick, you want to add anything before we open up to council discussion? No, I would just state that you've... Um, you continue the public hearing, but you're in a position to close it at your next meeting and then vote on it should you wish to do so. And the purpose of tonight was, I think, was just to discuss any open items that you had. Okay. I, I wanted to follow up with a question about police overtime. Um, I, I, I was looking at the police overtime number, and it doesn't look like it's gone up too much based on, on uh, this year. And I just wanted to know if we're accounting for it in a more holistic way next year, knowing that it's going to be a big bill, or if we'll continue moving money from contingency to police overtime. Um, the short answer is we, we did take into account the overtime that we thought we were going to have. Um, I don't have the budget up in front of me, but if memory serves, we had raised it from 800000 and changed to over a million dollars. And that reflects the fact that we're down eight staff and we're covering two or three shifts now every week with overtime. In addition to having overtime, because we're at minimum shift, anytime we do training, anytime we do uh, schools, like uh, some, of the, some of the staff have to go and take certain classes, mm -hmm. that automatically throws us into overtime. So what, what we have, we feel, is a... Is a, is a good number. Um, if we lose more police, it may increase, and we may have to tap contingency, but we had included everything we thought in there. And we, we've brought this number up to reality. In 2021, this was artificially low, um, and they just kept backfilling it, and I think we bit that bullet back in 2021 or 2022, and we raised it up to seven or 800,000, and now we've put it up, reflecting the reality that we're spending over a million dollars a year on overtime. And absent having more bodies in the department, uh, we, we're doing our best to manage it by not doing superfluous events and um, limiting how many people we bring on, on shift for certain things. Mm -hmm. um, but there's only so much control we have until we get more police officers. Okay, thanks. And you may be looking at, I'm pulling it up, but I think you're looking at the 
the revised budget as opposed to the adopted budget? Because it's about a $200,000 increase year over year. Maybe, yeah. I'm just confirming that. Yeah, so, so we're, the revised budget was 1032000 and change. The proposed budget is 1045000 and change. Mm -hmm. Last year's adopted budget was well below that. It was 842000 right. Yeah. So um, we were at a number, and, and this goes all the way back to 2022. If you go back to 2020 and 2021, it was quite a bit lower. Not because we were spending it, but because nobody wanted to put that number in the budget. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking because the, the conting contingency fund went up. Um, I know there's another driver to that, um, but I would be very interested in putting the community grants back into the budget. Um, and because I, you know, I don't really, the conversations that we have around the budget, it's kind of hard to, to, to question every line. So the one that I go to automatically is the contingency, but I would like to see those community grants restored. I think they're valuable. Um, I think they build, um, they build community and I think there's value to that. Um, and they build the capacity of nonprofit organizations. I'm also very interested in the proposals uh, put forward last week regarding uh, housing justice coordinator um, and uh, understanding that I don't think we want to take on another head count in fringes. I'm wondering if we maybe could try to approach housing justice by maybe bringing someone on on a contract basis, perhaps a small contract to pilot it out um, and then they can look at ways to inform the public landlords and tenants about good cause eviction um, and some of the other requests made by the public last week um, including maybe hel helping the housing department with the uh, with the rental registry if that is in fact an issue um, is there anybody else that um well may I, may I give you some additional information and sure. then maybe we open it up yeah. you, you raised three points mm -hmm. one was that the contingency is high the contingency is high because it contains um, the cost of living increases that we just added to CSEA. Mm -hmm. And you'll see we added an item, CSEA approved their contract. We'll be talking about that as the last item tonight. Most of that were raises for existing staff. Number two, you raised the community grants. I'm not sure if you were present for the conversation with Mark Price, but that comes down to what do you want to do and what don't you want to do? We don't have enough staffing in the rec department to do the list of things that we need to do next year. That includes overseeing the capital project to improve South Avenue Park. It includes uh, adding the skate park, which we took on through the participatory <coughs> budgeting. Originally, we were going to do a patch of ten or $15,000. We're doing a wholesale reboot of that, um, that facility. And then we're also queuing up improvements to River, mm -hmm. Riverfront Park. Now, what we learned this year with WePlay <coughs> is that um, when, when something goes sideways on a project, it, it absorbs Mark's time, and he really didn't have time to do this. And mm -hmm. he, he came to me and he said, look, we tried to have the committee do this. The committee was, was generally really not enthusiastic about doing this. Mm -hmm. They wanted to work on improving parks recreation programs which is what they signed up for we're really not set up to be a grant making agency we did that during covid we did a number of things during covid we set up you know parklets so that businesses could have an outdoor space well once covid was over we ended that this was started in covid to try to help some of the not for profits and again we didn't have a lot of applications last year, and I have no confidence that we have the capacity to even implement this next year, unless you want to say, well, let's put South Avenue Park off, or let's not Obviously, do the Obviously, I'm not park. proposing to put off those other things, but I am, I, I didn't realize that the committee didn't want to do this, because I was, I didn't think this took any of Mark's time, because this was something that we all agreed that the Recreation Committee would evaluate. Well, they, they didn't agree. Okay. You, you, we've, we, I mean, this is like participatory budgeting. The first year you put participatory budgeting in, we really didn't have a way to implement it. Mm -hmm. And I <coughs> fortunately was able to find a really great 
conduit for that in working with Aaron Hadelin from the high school. So we had the seniors come and they're coming next week. So that, that has been successful. I, I wouldn't say the community investment grant has been as successful in its okay. implementation. So it's history, by the way, it, it didn't appear during COVID. It used to be a $10,000 uh, payment to green teens. And then in 2020, when we had our budget discussion, we talked about opening it up to the broader nonprofit uh, sector in, in Beacon. So just update on the history. Thank on you. That. All right. Yeah, I mean, and again, the, I, I the think. The third item, I just wanted to note, on some of the points raised about the housing coordinator just are not issues. We have a rental registry. That is enforced. There, I don't know who decided that that's not being enforced, but I will tell you that is enforced, and I don't think it does what people think it does. The rental registry is, is just registering a property so that we have the ability to get in touch with both the owner and the tenant in that. And then I think we do an, a, a biannual or every three year um, inspection. inspection. But, it, but again, that's fully, we have invested in our building department. They're doing a lot more than they were able to do when they were three people rather than five. Um, so a lot of the things that were raised about what this position would do, our building department is doing, and they're doing it better than they have in the past. It's not perfect, but we are certainly you know, moving in that direction. I will say I think that that came from um, I think that came from a conversation we had around good cause and there were some questions the council raised about the you know we all thought that there was a rental registry and that we could use that information to help us understand the number of landlords and tenants in the area and I think during that discussion it was it, the impression I got was that the rental registry was not being updated or maintained and that inspections were not necessarily happening. No, so I'm, I'm happy to hear if that's not the case, but I think that that is a discussion that we had and I was certainly surprised by that, that discussion. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we so were shorthanded and we've, over the last year, we've gotten caught up. I mean, there's things that we're still not caught up on. The, the um, enforcement at STRs is imperfect because they pop up, they go down, we notify them. Um, and, and again, it, it's a bit of a game of chase, but we've, we've now increased the number of licensed um, short-term rentals to somewhere between 40 and 50. We had 10 when we started, um, and we're moving in that direction. Every, uh, we, we've gotten new um, software through Ministry for the building department, and they're able to do more. So you have good people in the building department. I I, this is in no way a question about anybody's integrity or, or whether they're a good person or not. But I do want to confirm that what you're saying at this point is that all rentals are undergoing an inspection on the cycle that's required in our code, which I believe what, is two years. Whatever is in the code is being done. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm of the same view on that particular subject. And I did not hear that it wasn't occurring. Certainly the rent register is uh, sending out an application every, it's either two or three years to update your information. I know that's being done. Uh, it could have been just limited to some of the inspections or whatever, because they were short staffed. Um, on this, uh, another item on uh, funding for legal aid, if you recall, we did that for the first year during uh, COVID, uh, and then legal aid got a bunch of grant money and it was viewed as unnecessary. At this stage, if we were to do something, um, I think, you know, one, we'd have to demonstrate need, and two, we'd have to demonstrate everyone else is doing it. There's no particular reason for us to be giving taxpayer money when the legal aid, you know, groups are being funded fully by other sources. Um, the third item, and I'm just working backwards from their list, was an ad campaign, uh, and that was with respect to good cause. I, I have no objection to that. I think that's pretty straightforward. I think the most the, the easiest way to do that is for good cause to be relevant, someone has to file an eviction notice. The moment the eviction notice is filed, I would hope the court would provide all that information as part of their disclosure. And if they don't, I'm happy to have that done via the city. Uh, if we wanted to do a broader ad campaign, I'd like to understand what it's for, uh, because that's the relevant point for it. And then finally, I did look at the housing coordinator job description in the city of Hudson. They were funded uh, by a combination of the $10 million DRI grant, which 
I think you've all heard uh, we're a victim of our own success and we're unlikely to ever get one of those, so we haven't applied. And then an additional grant with respect to housing. The job description didn't strike me as having anything that was terribly helpful, to be honest. I mean, I'm happy to share it with you all, um, but I just didn't see much there. Um, the comment made by some that somehow a housing coordinator would advise our planner on planning and zoning is just specious. That's just not the background of someone who's involved in housing coordination. I would rely on a planner, a professional planner, and not anyone mm -hmm. else. Um, just for a point of reference, the person who is the housing justice coordinator in Hudson is a certified planner. So to clarify that, they, they are a planner. They are not necessarily advising somebody else. Um, I had a conversation with this person, which I think is probably more enlightening than a job description. And some of the things that they mentioned I thought could be incredibly helpful, especially trying to keep people out of court for eviction because by the time that happens it is really far too late and it's pretty much guaranteed to happen and one of the things i found most interesting about what she said is that they've really established quite a good relationship between the landlords and the city where when somebody begins to fall behind rather than let them continue to suffer and struggle um, they try to remedy that pretty much immediately so that instead of trying to make up five to six months worth of rent which is pretty much impossible and that's when you end up in eviction court and you can hear all about the good cause eviction things that probably don't apply to you at that point. Um, they try to remedy that immediately and that most people are not going through that cycle again. So to me I find a lot of value in having a one-time kind of solution or handhold that keeps people out of eviction court. Well, one thing I'll add to that, she also noted that in Hudson, it seems like there is at least a good portion of those who are eligible for the addiction support that Amber was just describing, who actually are already in subsidized housing. So this is not necessarily those who are in private housing with private landlords, but those who already have it and still are facing challenges. And as Amber said, this is a way to support them to get them back on track. Mm -hmm. I'm, I was struggling to understand that. It was kind of garbled. I don't know if there's a way you could say that again, <coughs> Molly. It was uh, hard can you to hear, hear me you. now? Yes. So of those who got the support in Hudson, a good portion of them were actually already in subsidized housing. So this is not, this eviction support is not just for those in private housing. It's also for those who are already have some form of rent relief or some form of they're already in housing where they've had to apply and meet some criteria for their income and yet they still need this one time support for whatever it is they're facing. I think too if I were to like think about these suggestions a little bit more broadly, I think that commun to me the ask about well, you should tell people about good cause eviction kind of goes back to something we've been talking about quite some time, which is how do we communicate better with our community? I don't think that's the only thing that we need to tell people about or to help inform them of. And we've never quite really succeeded in figuring out how to do that or who should be doing that. Um, and I, I, I think the, well, I'm not saying that we should hire a full-time person, I think that there are elements of this housing justice um, coordinator that would be helpful here in Beacon, whether it's from a planning perspective that we focus more on developing an affordable housing plan and understanding what we can do to encourage mixed types of housing so that we're not just building all sorts of luxury everywhere, um, to where we should maybe make some exceptions or allowances to encourage more than that 10% affordable workforce. I think those are the kind of things that are being driven out of that position and that we have, we have been asking to do for some time and it has not gotten anywhere. So on zoning changes, um, all I will say with respect to not getting anywhere is the council has struggled when they hear um, that our 10% uh, inclusionary zoning without any give back is um, almost extraordinary and unlike anywhere else that have had give backs that come with it. And that our experts that we've brought in have said if you want to do a higher number you have to give something. Whether it's a tax reduction, whether it's an assessment change, whether it's additional units, 
that the numbers don't work. And we've heard that from people who are committed, uh, like for instance, Community Preservation Corporation, to the construction of you know, sustainable housing in cities. And despite hearing that, nobody is willing to actually say, okay, let's be real here, what can we actually do as opposed to what we would like to do? And we haven't gotten very far. I'd very much like to come back to that issue and address it. But again, at some point in the conversation, we'll have to be realistic about what's doable and what's not. The public has some, you know, people have suggested, well, we'll just raise the inclusionary number to 50%. Well, why don't we just make it 100%? We'll get no construction whatsoever. If that's what we want, fine. But the reason we're not getting anywhere is that the reality that we're addressing in terms of the cost of construction is not what people would like ideally. And we're going to have to address it. A housing coordinator isn't going to do any of that. That's a council decision that we are all going to have to come to grips with. Well, yeah, I have a different perspective on that. We had that conversation two years ago, and I didn't hear as clear a distinction as what you're describing. We have a new council now. Um, we have had for almost a year, um, and this council has also been asking to come back to this issue. So John Clark said exactly that. Our new planner said exactly that. The CPC person said exactly that. The Dutchess County planner said exactly that. Would you like us to bring them all in? We can bring them all in again. Would that do it? I recall that we asked for more details, more information yeah. about uh, what exactly that percentage would be, what exactly the give back would be. And the question I heard was an understanding of what housing we would actually get back for giving some of these tax incentives out. And as far as I know, we have not gotten that data back and it's been two years. Good. Could you repeat again what it is that we were looking for that we haven't gotten? I, I guess I missed it. If the question is, we won't get any more affordable housing without additional tax incentives, I believe the question was, how much more affordable housing could we get with what tax incentives? Oh, you know, our planner gave us that point, which is if you want to provide a fourth floor, you could go to 15 or 20 percent. I think, believe that was the statement that was made at the time. CPC said virtually the same thing. Was the range that they're looking at is somewhere in that 15 to 20 percent range. There has to be a positive to make the numbers work. Our planner, John Clark, said that us going to 10 percent, and this was a rough estimate on his part, actually reduced demand for new construction or the supply of new construction in Beacon after that went into place. If you'd like more evidence, let's just tee it up. But at some point, we actually need to deal with the reality that nobody else has a number like 50%, right? Everywhere else has numbers like 10% with a give back. We don't, and if we wanna go higher, we're gonna have to do something. I think the most straightforward one would be the fourth floor, right? Because that increases the number of units rather than decreasing our tax revenue or decreasing our assessments, which reduces our tax revenue. Right, so that would be the direction I would prefer to go. I believe our planner would say exactly the same thing. I spoke to her today and said we will be wanting to come back in, and I did compare notes with her, and that's what she thinks is the best approach. We'd have to decide where that's appropriate and where it's not. So two questions for me. Um, wouldn't the current uh, public benefit requirement for a fourth floor cover that already? So you would say if you did affordable housing, you would get your fourth floor. So we already right. have that law on the books. Uh, on Main Street. On Main right. Street, yeah. Right, because that would be one of the trade-offs, and we could ask for that, <coughs> mm -hmm. right? We don't know how the numbers would work. Those are kind of smaller in terms of the total number of units in a building. Mm -hmm. The ones that are more open land, um, it could be a bigger number because, you know, there's, there's value in scale, right? Mm -hmm. So. I think the other thing that, uh, the second thing for me is, um, you know, comparing us to other communities is, is is fine but it doesn't actually tell me what the market is bearing so you know when that one guy that came and talked to us you know he talked about you would have to do give backs but based on what like if if we were to propose going to 15 percent or we were to replace the 10 percent to be section 8 housing what evidence exists that that would make that project unviable like who's is there any data that says that going this high is unviable that's what I don't, that's what I, I still haven't seen is I haven't seen any proof that, that this approach would not work. 
So as, as I understand it, the numbers are specific to each project, right? And so to say, give me some magical spreadsheet that tells me what the answer is, is just not gonna happen. We asked that question of the CPC guy and he said there isn't some specific number. These are judgment calls, right? And if you want a judgment call, we've had plenty of those. If you want something that says, no, I, I need a model that demonstrates the answer, you're not gonna get that. So in the absence of getting that, we can just keep talking about this and not get anywhere, or you know, we can make a judgment call. And I, I think that's our best bet. We've been trying to work this for some time. I like our fourth floor on Main Street arrangement. If we wanna be focused on affordable, that's already in place. It's not in place anywhere else that we have large development opportunity. If we wanted to put something like that in place, and I had, I had suggested that that might be appropriate on Route 52, and again, the council didn't get anywhere, so I stuck it in an ad hoc committee. But I we would love us done. <laughs> We I'm had almost sure. finished the law. The last thing that John Clark recommended was that we pass that law and that the committee not be created. Um, and, I, and I confirmed that when, when I ran into him and Ryan back the other day. <laughs> so what, um, so just to be clear, we, we're almost done with that law. Um, no, what I recall was there were some council members who wanted to reduce the height, yeah. not yep. increase the height. Correct. There were other council members who thought that um, the entire strip of Route 52 should be a protected viewshed, which would effectively reduce height. We had others that said uh, we should increase the percentage of affordable housing without any give back. Those were not issues that I could see being resolved. And I didn't think that, this, that the council at the time had the capacity or the time to address the issues, so I gave it to an ad hoc committee. Um, if we were close um, and we could have passed simply applying form-based zoning to that district and reducing the parking requirement, I would have been all for it. It took us six months just to do the parking requirement, if I recall, so I can't quite say we were ready to go, right? So I would have a different view than you. And Mayor, if I could just bring this back to the budget, sorry. Sorry. Um, I, would, I would just say this year we, we were very clear we weren't creating any new positions um, because our major investment is trying to catch up with inflation that eroded the, the buying power of our employees over the last few years. So you're going to see when we talk about CSEA, these are, these are higher increases than we've had in the past. I, that doesn't mean I don't need other positions. Um, somebody may think that we need a housing justice person, but I know I need a finance person. I know I need a deputy to the assessor. Um, she would like a full time. I know that I need two to three more firefighters, and we've deferred that until we get a grant. Um, I also know that I'd like to hire a full time planner at some point. So again, we, we deferred any requests for adding new positions, including contract positions, because we knew we had a focus. We've, we've presented a balanced budget. This is the first budget in more than 10 years and probably in 20 years that doesn't rely on fund balance to balance the books. So if you do want to add anything, you're going to have to tell us either you're going to raise you want to raise the taxes further, or you want to dip in the fund balance, or you want to take it from somewhere else. Contingency fund was where I started. Well, the, the, there's, it's not in the contingency fund. I'm, I'm telling you, we're going to use that contingency fund for the CSEA contract that they just approved this afternoon um, that I'm bringing to you tonight. Um, so I'll just say, you know, looking back on this process, having gone through it a few years, I think it's um, the way that the budget is presented is that uh, here are the ideas um, that the administration had, and here's the budget put forward, and if city council wants to do anything else, we have to raise other people's tax, we have to raise people's taxes, or we have to ask questions about the budget that we have been told, trust us, Susan does a good job. So it doesn't you, you feel like... You can make a like resolution to do it. I'm, I, I don't care what you do, Dan, but mm -hmm. you have to balance the budget. We're not the state, we're not the federal government where you can run a deficit. I don't so, want to run a deficit. So, I'm trying it, to avoid running a no, deficit. No, I'm just but saying... The way that the process so, is so I just set want to hear Dan out. Can we hear him out? I think that the process is set up, and, and I know everyone here appreciates here the importance of every voice being heard, but the way that... I'll tell you, last year I brought up an idea at a meeting right around this time, and I was told it was too late to bring up new ideas. Um, and so I guess when we lay out the process for the budget, I think it should be very clear on 
you know, like, when can we, when can we raise questions, new ideas, and, and will the administration please help us find solutions that will not raise taxes? So, um, yeah, I, I have no issue with the council raising any number of items in the budget that they want now. And the answer wasn't just raising taxes. In fact, Chris um, enumerated three different approaches, right? Which is, um, you know, reduce something else, raise the tax, or take it out of fund balance. Um, I, there might be additional ones, but it certainly wasn't the only option is to raise no, taxes. No. I'm pleased that you don't want to raise taxes because, you know, under the charter, the mayor proposes a budget, um, and, you know, I try to stick to it. Um, if you've got other things you want to talk through, if a majority of you want to add it, you just got to determine how to fund it, right? And again, there's different options that Chris gave you. I think one of the questions that Dan is bringing up is understanding, or at least I should say this is a question I have, what is the best route for pricing out and budgeting new ideas? Is that through you, Chris? Do you have capacity for us to bring you ideas in that format? I, I think the challenge for me, Paloma, is there are a lot of things that are raised at this table. And I, I don't have a good way of saying what should be followed up on and what shouldn't. It doesn't seem like the council even has a consensus on what it wants. Um, so it's hard for me to, to allocate ta staff time towards pricing something out when it, there's been no specific request. We're, we're at no mid-November. Nobody said, hey, could you price out X? Could you price out Y? Um, we, we can try to do that. I don't know. I mean, you could put a general number in for something. I think we could guess what a housing person would be. Um, I think it's going to depend on the scope of what you do. But again, uh, we bring, we bring a, bu a proposed budget. If you want to change the budget, you have the power to do that. You can uh, do an amendment to the budget and you just tell say where you want the money put and where you're taking the money from. We came up with a proposed budget that kept taxes, tax increases well below the tax cap. It's less than 3% for homes and it's a decrease actually for the commercial properties because of the uh, way that we break down non-homestead and homestead. Um, and again, I, we put in the things that the department heads asked for, but we didn't put in any of the there are a lot of other items I would have loved to add, but I, we wanted to try to bring a balanced budget. So earlier, the, the, question, the answer is earlier, but I would like to have a consensus of the council when you want to do something. Because if I you know, chased every idea that's brought here, I would do nothing but chase ideas that were yeah. brought up here. Well, I mean, you know, I wait for all the presentations, and then I, and then I share the ideas that I have. And I don't know which of those presentations would have been the appropriate one to bring up a housing justice coordinator. And, you know, frankly, I think it should, we should just say, like, are there new ideas that council members want to bring up? And that's the first meeting. <laughs> I, I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't or, run the meetings. And secondly, we do a monthly call, Dan, and you have never raised that issue with me, not once. Let me we do a monthly call, and you could have said, hey, how, do, how would I do this? How much would it cost? I, let me well, situate. because that's not the process. We do everything in public. I'm not going to try yeah, to get you, the you could say, I'm thinking about this. How would I do th I mean, you, again, you could have had, we talk about lots of things on our calls. I yeah. do that with multiple members of the council. Mm -hmm. And you can always raise that question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, I, I just think, well, it's to a wait to mid-November. See, that's the thing. Here we go. So, well, like, I mean, the reason been, why it's a pattern for me now and we why brought it's coming Susan up for me now is that when I make it, hang, on, hang on, hang on, and it's the we same. We need one person at a time. So, Dan, why don't you go ahead? So, I, I brought up new ideas at the end of the budget process last time, and I was told it was not the right time. But nobody said what the right time was. So now, here we are. We, get, we hear feedback from the public. I want to incorporate the public's feedback into the budget because I think they actually shared some really good ideas, and I'm told that it's too late in the process now. Well, so maybe like... You have the power to amend the budget. Use that power. Yeah. We proposed a budget. But what I'm Use saying is power. I don't know where to take the money from. If, you, if I can't take I it know, from contingency, and I don't balance. want to take it... Take it from the fund balance. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, do we just want to propose that there is um, an amount allocated to some council priorities from the fund balance? I think we can pick a number. And then, again, the council has asked for two very specific things um, in a workshop, which is how we go about in the charter, getting things onto the agenda. We asked for a um, you know, discussion about a study for general accessibility, and we asked for a discussion about inclusionary zoning. Um, I would be happy to say, let's take X amount of money from the fund balance and say that that is dedicated to council discussions, put a set end time on determining what that money is for, and then we can move on. Yeah, so um, that's the right general approach. I mean, asking for raising issues, you know, before the budget gets baked, I mean, as far as I can tell, the housing issues were raised last week. Um, so maybe you all had those ideas before, but I, I hadn't heard them before that. Um, that's perfectly fine. As Chris said, you have the power to amend the budget. Y your options are, you know, take the money out of something else, uh, increase the tax rate, or, um, you know, use general fund balance. You don't have to know exactly what the answer is. I agree with you. Uh, Amber, which is you don't have to have it all figured out, right? Um, but you do have to have a general sense of what it's for. You can't say whatever we choose later on. I think at least some some direction on that. And I'll look to Nick for how general can we be in a budget item. So, <laughs> I mean, that's a broad question I'm asking for a general yeah. answer. So, you're not allowed to. So the controller recognizes that you can have contingency because you need to have funds that are unexpected, but the general guideline is monies that are being appropriate that you're taxing for need to be earmarked towards a specific expenditure. So are there, so if you put it in a member item grant, you know, just subjects, you so can do that, but they would prefer that it be dedicated to specific budget items. All right, so hearing that, what, what would work with what Amber said is if the council were to allocate funds for a study with respect to um, planning or complete streets or e even something on planning on zoning or other things, would that work? Absolutely would, yes. Okay. And you so have that a would, line. I, I'd suggest do that. Right? Okay. You, you have and a line in the city council budget. Could, and the other thing that I would propose um, kind of goes back to my first point is perhaps we also say that that is to develop some kind of community-based communication plan. Yeah, that would be appropriate. Well, yeah. we've, we've now just put four or five, I, this is part of the problem. Like we've just talked about five different ideas. I will be happy to summarize them for you. That, I am I'm, the I'm elected okay person that, at this table and I'm not going to fight with you about you, it. I'm just saying we have no guidance on what to do because you want to do everything at once. Well, but I, I don't think we have to solve that in the budget. I think what we need to solve in the budget is if there's an item uh, that a majority of the council wants to do and they can identify how to, you know, how to make the budget balance um, and to fulfill what Nick said, which is some general description of what we're talking about. The other thing I might add is if halfway through the year you want to allocate it for a different purpose, the council has to do, an do that too. Yes. Right? So I, I don't think you need to go further than if you feel obliged to spend some money that is not in the budget, identify where it goes, be reasonably directed as to for what purpose, and how is it funded. Okay. Right. I don't think you have to go in utter detail after that. Yeah, I think the three things that we are circling in on are developing a community-based communication plan, and I'll look to you all to agree or deny. So a community-based communication plan, um, a study of accessibility, and enhancing non-personal vehicle transportation. Yes. Great. Yes. Well, there's the line for planning studies, which last year there was budgeted for 30,000. This year there isn't anything proposed budget, so. Right, just to specify that one, um, what we were hoping and the county said they would likely do is through their transportation council, I think they were gonna fund um, a study to look at reducing the speed from 30 down to 25. And is that why we took that piece out? Was because we have that yes. coming? Because okay. the Transportation Council funds that with federal funds, and they just are finishing one in Poughkeepsie, 
so they know how to do it and it wouldn't be met with, well, you put your you know, finger on the scale, your thumb on the scale. For those two things, my guesstimate would be $75,000. I think that's a high end. That's exactly what I was thinking. Great. Great. Can we request that it not come from fund balance and we try to find 75000 from other line items or a combination of contingency and other line items? It, it's not in, and I don't have fluff in this budget. I mean, I kept the budget really close and tight because we're trying to afford significant raises for the workforce. Yeah, I mean, um, if the council would like uh, to request the finance director to look at it, um, that certainly can be done, but I have a feeling what, you know, Chris has suggested is going to be the answer, which is uh, it ain't in there. Um, so, again, if, if it isn't, and we can ask the finance director that, um, then your options would be, um, you know, choosing something to cut or um, a fund balance or... You know, you're, you're saying you don't want to raise the tax rate, so I won't. That's add right. That as an we option. don't. We don't yeah, want to so do I that. I think fund balance fund seems appropriate. Yeah. So, I but think the, fund the mechanism is would fine. be an amendment. It would to be an amendment to the budget to increase the expense line, as discussed, and then a, in that same amendment to increase the income level by uh, revenue by transferring seventy-five thousand from the fund balance to the general budget. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, I would just challenge us to, like, actually get plans in motion, I, I want to say first quarter, and if it turns out that these are not, like, the right things, then we should do a budget amendment and return it to the fund balance. I, I don't know how I'm going to do this next year. I mean, we're in the middle of $40 million of capital projects. Just because the firehouse got finished doesn't mean all of the financial stuff is done for that, and there's a lot of extra work going on. In January, we're going to be starting the Melzinga Dam, a $5 million dewatering project at the wastewater treatment plant, and a bunch of other items like putting solar panels on the highway garage. My no, comment about timing I, was more directed to the, the council. Floor, Amber. Please. Go right ahead. Well, I'm sorry, Dan. I, All right. So go ahead, go ahead Chris. There is, there's a general <laughs> issue with tone. It's it's really got to bring it, down the tone. I'm, I'm just trying to say, like, there's, a, there's an amount of stuff that we can get done every year. You're, you're going to have to make decisions on what doesn't get done if you want to add new things to the work program. We've been talking about this, this prioritization. Now, the prioritization has worked because we've been able to do a lot of things. But we've also had to say no to a lot of things. So um, the only thing I would add is um, that particular issue of what the city has the capacity to do um, doesn't have to be decided here, right? And I'm just trying to help you all out. What has to be decided here is if you want to alter the budget by what amount, for what purpose, and how is it funded. You may discover along the way that you don't want to spend the money that way, mm -hmm. and as you said, you might return it to fund balance. You might also discover we don't have the, you know, the capacity to do it. That might affect what you spend the money on. Um, but that's okay. That doesn't have to be sorted right now. Yeah, and I, I can just clarify my comment around timing was really for the council to determine what our plans are and what we want to do. I wasn't asking you to do something by Q1. Because you're sitting here and saying, I don't know what the council wants. You guys don't give me direction. I'm saying the council should give direction by Q1. Okay. I, I'm just recognizing the limitations of what we can get done in a year. Limitations. Any, I'm, you I'm sorry, Dan. Go I have ahead. the floor. Please. I'm going to take a break. Well, You've got the floor. Yeah, I, great. So any one of the three things that you mentioned is enough to do in one year. You want to do a plan, you want to do the plan well, and it needs to be staffed. You'll recall we did a recreation plan. That took a lot of work to do. This, the traffic study next year is to, to reduce the speed limit is going to take a lot of work from, from myself, from the planner, from other departments. We, we keep adding but we don't ever take away. You, you've asked for multiple planning studies. And again, I, I have told you, we can support about one good planning study each year because we're also participating in other planning studies. 
We sit on the Dutchess County Transportation Council. We're on the Beacon Hopewell Rail Trail Committee. I'm trying to work with the Fjord Trail to get them a maintenance facility. There are a lot of things that you ask for all year long that we turn around and we do despite having very limited resources. I'm just trying to be realistic about what we can and can't do. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing a record number of capital projects, so that takes time from our staff. Chris, you have told me in the past and you've told the council in the past that you look forward to the firehouse being done because that's going to free up your capacity. We have council, we have committees that are trying to do grants and they're being told no. Council members are proposing new ideas and we're being told no. And the origin of all of that is the city's capacity, which I am taking to mean your capacity. No, it's we not, have in, it's let me not finish. Hang on, hang on. We have had in the past, we have brought up the idea of creating a deputy city administrator to increase capacity. Part of the goal of the housing justice coordinator is to alleviate some of the capacity that's on other uh, departments. And we're also being told no to that. So it feels like we're being told that we're a rubber stamp and that the committees should stop being working forward to having ambitious ideas because of the city's capacity. And that's well, how it feels after five years of this. Did yeah, I? Well, I'll so agree with that. Well, then what, I can add, what I can add is, look, I've been sitting at this chair on and off for 30 years. I am a lot more patient than I think most of the people at this table. And you know, if you think that the pace of government uh, can run at the pace of, you know, I don't know, a race car or something else, you know, you have, you still should be sitting here a little while longer. Things take a fair amount of time. That firehouse, the first study was started up in 2005. The conversations about a central station were 2003. That's 21 years. And things take a while. So, you know, I hear you that, you know, it'd be nice to get all these things done, but I would also suggest to you that it's not just, you know, we're just saying you can't do anything and you need to be a rubber stamp. It's just there's a, there is a time frame associated with government that takes a while and you might want to just take a breath and say how can we schedule this and what's the process i i asked on and off for 10 years to get um, online payments for the city it didn't happen until i was mayor and we had COVID, and then we got it done because you know there was a big queue of stuff that finance had to do but then it was essential so then it got done um so you know i i hear you i, I can imagine that you're frustrated but there's also a pace that cities do. So well, what I think would you we've like resolved to do? the count. I, I made an amendment. I have nothing right. else to say. Yeah. So the budget resolution, when it gets adopted, we would include in that resolution language to amend the budget to address Great, the Great, thank items. you. All right. So if you want, we can have that ready for your meeting on Monday. Where is the council on that? I'm supported with Amber's amendment. Okay. All right. Cool. Again, all the other issues we've discussed, we don't have to sort out immediately, but that's the one we do, okay? So uh, what I heard was 75 uh, planning item for the city fund balance. Did I hear that right? Is that okay? Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you all. Um, that was a good conversation, actually. I, I, I know it you know occasionally got we all had opinions but it was actually a pretty good conversation and an important one for us to have so thank you um, are we okay to go on or is there more budget stuff it's okay no let's go on all right so the next one uh, is a draft resolution on uh, state aid for local governments um, Do, oh I think I would go to number seven finish, finish up yeah we'll go back to them okay that out. all right why don't we just do seven uh, those, yeah, seven's quick, right? Yes. So could you just tell us, uh, either Chris or Nick, what, what uh, NICOM wants from us to do? Um, NICOM has asked us to support continued increase uh, AIM funding. AIM is aid and in incentives to municipalities. We currently get $1.54 million a year in AIM. Last year, the state did increase that just on a temporary basis of about 178000 um, this is a push that NICOM makes every year and asks the cities, the 62 cities in the city, in the state uh, to support that. So it's just a simple resolution asking our state representatives to consider increasing the aim. Okay. And um, if I remember correctly, uh, aim funding is like the third or fourth largest revenue item that we've got and it hasn't increased for 
a bajillion years. It's been a while. Um, yeah, so. Okay. Um, let's back up to item five. Is that all right? Yep. So item five is the certificate of occupancy for 248 Tyronda. It is not about the commercial component. This is about the residential component and the amendment that we made to allow a CO to be issued on a residential piece first, right? That is correct, Mayor. This was last before the council at your October 14th workshop. At that time, the applicant's attorney um, appeared before the council, provided an overview of their request. Council had some questions and discussions. They explained their marketing program. Um, during that meeting, there was a discussion about a request being made in 2021 to the Zoning Board of Appeals. The council was subsequently provided with that information, as was the applicant, and it was added to the agenda packet for tonight's meeting today. And that information includes the ZBA's July and August 2021 agenda packet and minutes, um, as well as the applicant's September letter withdrawing their application, which Bell explained tonight. And the agenda packet also includes a letter submitted on November 8th from the applicant's attorney offering further uh, commentary on why they believe the request should be um, supported by the council. And Mr. Brad Schwartz from the firm of Zarin Simons is here tonight to um, represent the applicant. Good evening, Nick. Thank you for that opening. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council, Mr. Administrator. Um, so Brad Schwartz from Zarin Steinmetz. I'm also joined by Brian Mossy of uh, Berkshire Hathaway, our broker who I promised we would bring back uh, tonight. Brian will describe the general commercial market. Um, both how it's evolved before COVID to where we are today, as well as his precise marketing efforts on the building now to try to find a commercial tenant. Before I turn over to Brian, I just wanna make some remarks following last time's meeting. Um, and, I, and I hope I captured all this in my letter to you, right? Last time was the first time I was before your council. Um, I listened closely um, and I certainly appreciated the, the council's frustration that was expressed and the underlying sentiment, frankly, that perhaps our client is trying to either get away with something or didn't violate or, or did violate the code. Um, and I tried to respond to all of that in, in the letter. Um, we provided the chronology that the council asked for. Um, we took your comments seriously, and I assure you that there was never an intent to violate the code. Um, we put the apology towards the end of my letter. I'm gonna start with it this evening. My client apologizes for lapse in communication over the years. I heard that comment as well. I'm involved. I assure you that will be corrected going forward. We're here to work with the council. Big picture from a policy standpoint, we're trying to get 60 plus units online to help fulfill the housing demand, including six below market, while continuing to market this building for a commercial tenant. Brian's involved. He's listed the property. We're committed to this undertaking. We're not giving up on that anytime soon. Brian's going to explain, we get it. We're about to embark on the holiday season. We don't expect a whole lot to happen, frankly, over the next six, seven weeks, but we're committed to this effort through at least the end of March, the first quarter of next year, where we would expect to see an uptick in activity if there is a real viable tenant out there. So we could come back to questions about the ZBA proceedings or anything else that your council would obviously like us to address, but I'll, I'll turn Esther Bryan to address the market condition questions that have come up. Hello, good evening. My name is Brian Mossy. I'm a commercial real estate associate with uh, Berkshire Hathaway. I've been with Berkshire Hathaway for about 10 years. I run our commercial division, marketing platform, pretty much all facets of what we do commercially within the Hudson Valley. Um, here tonight to discuss the leasing and marketing efforts uh, specifically for 248 Tiranda. Also wanted to provide some background, my history and also- Pardon, could you just speak into the, or yes. adjust the mic? It's a little hard to hear you. Can you hear me better now? Yep. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Um, and also just to discuss, you know, some of the specific efforts on 248 and some of the other activity in the market. Um, in the last three years, I've actively been involved in 52 commercial leases and 63 sale transactions across the Hudson Valley. So I have experience, uh, I've worked with this developer and many others in the market. Um, and Beacon specifically, I've worked on the sale of 456 Main Street, 319 Main Street, 393 Fishgale Avenue, uh, Beacon Falls Lofts, the Beacon Knoll subdivision that Rieger Homes uh, is currently building, um, as well as leasing at 268 Main Street, 340 Main Street, and 364 Main Street. So a lot of experience. 
And I was the second wedding at the Roundhouse 12 years ago. So <laughs> for what it's worth. Um, the commercial real estate sales markets remain consistent and active on the sales side, um, really led by multifamily investing in industrial properties. That's the big driver, investors, sometimes owner users. Uh, the leasing market is not nearly as robust compared to the sales market. Following the pandemic, we started to see companies downsizing their commercial footprint, which was, I think, something a lot of people expected to see. There was a lot more hybrid work, work from home part-time. So companies realized, hey, we could maybe shave down 50% of our space, uh, save some of the overhead. So we've seen that sort of trickle out of the last two years because some, many would have done it immediately. As soon as they already had this set up for work from home, you just do it, but they had leases that tailed. So they might've had two years left on a lease. So once that expired, then they've put into motion a downsizing. So that's put a lot of pressure on vacancies in the office market in particular, which is the hardest hit by the pandemic. Um, so that's really, when you look at sort of supply and demand and, and a lot of demand right now is on the industrial side and the prices per foot on industrial space is pretty much in line with office space, which was unheard of 10 years ago. It used to be about half. So if you're looking for a warehouse and you're paying 18 or $20 a foot for warehouse space, that used to be eight to 10. And now that's pretty much in line with where office is because it's whatever growth there was, inflation that would have pushed the price up was offset by a lot of the relocation and, and companies downsizing. Um, there's a lot of office space around, not necessarily in Beacon, but in 52, Phylon Associates, a number of office buildings, medical office buildings in West's Business Center that have vacancies. Um, as far as T Ronda 248, I've known about the project for a few years. I've spent, I've sent the plans and specs and square footage options to probably five or six tenant prospects over the last few years. Uh, we had an urgent care, a jazz club uh, that ended up going to Patterson, a franchise fitness gym that's still sort of active in the market, um, some general office uses, and there's one other one. Oh, a co-working space that ended up going on to Main Street. So it's not, even though we just formally went with the MLS and LoopNet, the commercial marketing platform, there's been activity on this for the last couple of years. Um, so just going, talking about the real estate sort of profession in general, the majority of real estate agents in our market primarily focus on residential. There's probably eight to 10 agents that focus on exclusively commercial. And we tend to have sort of a, a old school networking approach where we just know who's coming, who's going, who's looking. There's not a lot of companies out there looking to relocate for five or 10,000 square feet. So we really have to be sort of on the ball and try to plug these into the right locations. Um, you know, when you, when you list a house on an MLS system, it syndicates to hundreds of websites, Zillow, Realtor, Trulia, all the sites you guys have probably been to. Commercial doesn't do that, so we have to pay to market it. It has to be on LoopNet and Craigslist. These are paid platforms, and that's why it tends to be a much smaller market with people that are willing to sort of invest all in on it. It does not help really at all to put it on the MLS. Um, Craigslist, LoopNet, OfficeSpace.com are the primaries. So when there's a tenant, when there's a medium size or a large company that comes into this market, often what happens is they've engaged with a national brokerage like a CBRE or a Cushman Wakefield. And we might get contacted from a broker out of Dallas, Texas. And they don't even know where Beacon is, but they have a client that they've been assigned to that has to find space. So they'll contact the five or six active commercial brokers in that market with criteria. And they say, put us, you know, put an RFP in front of us. What are you willing to do? This is what we need. So it's kind of, there's the local brokerage that controls all of the know about stuff, just what's out there. And then there's the, the regionals that tend to work with the bigger companies that we're targeting and sort of compete over via the RFP process. Um, so just going, so that's part of like what we've been doing on Tironda for the last few years, plus some of the additional marketing in the last uh, two months. So I pulled commercial leasing reports from CoStar, which is our primary commercial database, as well as the MLS. Looking at Dutchess County over the last three years, CoStar has 107 office and retail lease signings. Three years, 107. One key MLS has 62 over that same time period. The median square footage of the 62 lease spaces on the MLS is 1,150 square feet. So it's very small. You know, when you're building a 20 or 30,000 square foot building, it's hard to kick that off with a thousand square foot cafe or, or something small. That tends to be the backfill once you've sort of established like an anchor or something that you're building around. Um, 
According to CoStar's database for Beacon specifically, 11 commercial leases have been signed in the last 36 months and 10 leases over that same time on the MLS. So 21 leases combined over three years. And I'm sure you can tell just by looking around that that's not accurate. There's more leases than that have been signed. Um, and I think it goes back to the notion that probably about 50% of lease activity in a market is off market. It's, it's a broker just saying, you know, I know you own that building, when do you have space available? So a lot of it's just boots on the ground, broker to broker talk. In the, so you don't see the data, but it's happening. But that's just a, a huge function of how we operate, which is just off market. You know where stuff is, you have somebody and you call around. So 21 leases in Beacon, if I had to guess, there's probably more like 50 that have actually been signed over the last three years. I'm sure you guys have seen a lot more than 21 new businesses or offices open up. Um, in terms of switching gears a little bit to affordability uh, for housing, I've heard the concerns. I've watched other council meetings. Um, I was on the Dutchess County Housing Steering Committee in 21 with a number of supervisors, mayors, developers, people from Hudson River Housing. Um, and they did a, a comprehensive report for the county in 21. The report came out in 22. Um, you know, and it's, there's an issue with supply. It's hard to get projects approved through the red tape, through infrastructure, lack of municipal sewer, um, environmental concerns. It's very hard to get projects off the ground to sort of offset the issue that we're having. The reason prices continue to increase is because we haven't been able to put more units online. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll share an interesting sort of tidbit from that report. It's a public report that came out in March 22. Um, but this is what I thought was kind of the most interesting when it comes to the, the very real need of having apartments online as soon as possible. The county has a deficit of rental units affordable to households earning less than $35,000, obviously. It also has a deficit of rental units for households with incomes at or above $75,000. There's a surplus of apartments affordable to the income ranges of thirty-five dollars to $75,000. As a result, many lower income households are having to rent up into a unit that costs more than they can afford, while the higher income households are renting down into a unit that costs less than the standard 30% of monthly income. So the greater demand from the high end income group is putting more and more pressure over time on sort of that mid-level affordability. And it's, it's a fact, it's interesting, because it's what you see happening. So we sort of as a community, the greater Dutchess area, Beacon specifically, need to put online affordable units, whatever they may be, Section 8 workforce housing, but also market rate, higher end units, to take the pressure off of sort of the middle income. We and have, for about 15 to 20 years, been putting new units online constantly, and it hasn't changed anything, but thank you. <laughs> Yeah, but there's a five Maybe million has. dollar, Maybe uh, five it has. More million housing, five million unit housing shortage in the United States, and a half a million dollar shortage in the New York metro area. So even if we put on a thousand units in Beacon alone, we're not going to solve the problem by ourselves. I'll be honest and with you. The report suggested a countywide approach, and it would, took it as far as allocating specific amounts to each municipality and I think Beacon had 11 you know was it no it was five it was <laughs> five a year because those were supported the city housing. of Beacon has done their homework over the years and has one of the highest percentages of um, uh, assisted or subsidized rental housing in the county the only community that has a higher percentage is Poughkeepsie mm -hmm. right and that's one of the reasons why our number was so low Okay. Yeah. But again, if you want the market to work, we all have to do it, which is why the governor's office is trying statewide approaches, right. which is absolutely correct. I we agree. have to do our part. We can't ignore our part, but we can't, by our own part alone, solve the world's problems. Okay. I 100% agree. I don't think, and I think to your point, had, had those units not been built over the last 15 years, it would be a much bigger problem. So I'm sure they helped offset somehow. <laughs> I think there's a lot of displaced people who would disagree with you. But. Fair enough. There, there's a just one of the, the topics that have come up is, well, why not just frame and finish the building and, and hope for a tenant to come along some point in the future? Can you just address the, the concept of a, a commercial building on spec? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's pretty unheard of to spec build a multi-tenant commercial building. It's hard to finance. I believe this developer was able to get financing on the construction. But 
the majority of the time, you need 25%. You need an anchor tenant. That's, you remove the risk of the development. And it's also because when you're building on spec, you're missing all of these key elements that you end up having to backtrack on, whether it's mechanicals, plumbing, a medical use that requires extensive plumbing and sinks for doctor's offices that were not put into the plan, so then you're ripping things out that you put in. It's, it's pretty unheard of to spec build with no tenant. I think if you had 25 to 30 percent of the square footage leased, you start to take a little more risk and you put it off and you try to limit the specific build out so you still have the adaptability. You know, if you've got a, a gym that wants space and needs higher ceilings or bigger windows and, and you know, certain modifications, demising walls, the design of the MEP, the mechanicals, you know, if you've got a 6,000 versus a 10,000 and you're designing meters and it's just, can it be done? Of course. Is it risky? Yes. And I think it's relatively uncommon until you have at least one sort of anchor tenant, a corporate guarantee. If the if that is if that's difficult, why did the why did the builder do it all in one building? If it's more difficult to move around an anchor tenant in a single building, why didn't they just do sing, why didn't they do retail on every floor of all three buildings? I don't have the answer to that, but okay. So, but we're trying to present. You're trying to present a case tonight uh, that uh, this is good faith, right? My but when decisions are made that make it more difficult and all the residential is in two other two standalone buildings, it starts to get a little rocky, right? Right. And, and my and position on this is just... also only considering rentals, but you're not talking about sales. Mm -hmm. So you're focused on rentals and saying that the rentals mar market is really hard, but you're not focusing on sales, though the sales market might not be so bad. Sales of what? Of the, of the commercial property. Leasing. You wouldn't sell it. So there's a commercial building. Microphone? There's a commercial building, mm -hmm. and you're saying you're trying to rent out the commercial space. Lease space, right? Right. So why why isn't he building to sell to somebody? And like he could go other ways, right? Sell it as a pad. I don't know. I'm just saying that there's a, this sounds like there's a range of options that the builder chose not to take. And then we're on a very narrow path here and saying that it's unfeasible. Yeah, I think what I'm saying is I'm all in to help market this now. So <clears throat> perhaps my, my questions are for Mr. Schwartz then. And look, I, I would just keep in mind the chronology. The, the, the project was approved as the standalone commercial. I get it, it wasn't an integrated with a yeah, commercial mixed with residential mm -hmm. in the same building. It was a mixed use project, but obviously separate buildings. Mm -hmm. It was designed and just approved just after the start of COVID. So at the time, having a standalone mm -hmm. commercial building that could all be leased was, was viable. Um, right, so the project was in the works for a couple of years leading up to the approval just a month after COVID hit. So it's, I, I think from our perspective, and it goes back to even the same arguments, frankly, that were made at the zoning board, it's all about changed market conditions that were, it's not just a, a dip, you know, a, a, a lull in the economy. This was a obviously, I don't need to tell you all, a drastic change in commercial office conditions that we're trying to now address after the fact. Yeah, and it is somewhat interesting that, you know, obviously we all know when COVID was, I think based on your time frame, there's a lot of activity that was happening in 2021 and 22, and yet really no consideration of maybe taking any other conditions into account for the plans before breaking ground. I also want to share a point of information with the council. Um, I, I don't disagree with the, the framing that you mentioned, but I do want to share that I spoke to two people who do commercial financing and have combined about 65 years of experience, and their opinion of what concurrent is is not a pad. They agree you wouldn't frame the inside of the building, but that you would generally have the exterior. And so I just want to share because the only information we have is from the developers. Um, so take that for what it's worth. Thanks, Amber. And there are projections, you know, Deloitte 2024, September, there's projections about potential increases in commercial real estate for 2025. So, I mean, we're talking about static history, very recent history. You know, there are other opinions about what might happen in commercial real estate. There's a lot of factors at play. Which is what? Which parts of, which parts of commercial real estate, though? I mean, it covers a spectrum on what they talk about in the study. I, I have seen nothing that indicates the commercial office space is going to grow in the next five years. Not it's all multifamily uh, and some retail. Multifamily is, is huge. I mean, if we could build 
a hundred thousand, there's developers that want to do it in this area. Um, right, but in our code, multifamily is not what commercial is. Right. In our code, right. it's um, office space or retail for the most part, right? Yeah, industrial is the driver. Retail has recovered a lot better than I would have expected it to, but office has not. You can find office tenants, existing, mm -hmm. retrofit. It, they're out there, but it's not a market that you want to spec build an office building. You'd be crazy to do that right now. So, and you're not, and but uh, offices aren't the only option. Right. right. I'm just giving a general example. Yeah. It's, a, it's a tough segment of the market for sure. Mm -hmm. Retail uses, you know, co-working, gyms, more likely. But even still, right, despite all that, we hear the council's concerns, we know what the code provided, we know how the project was designed and approved as this mixed use, we're willing to continue giving it a shot. Uh, to, just to clarify, you didn't get an appeal, so you're, now you're giving it this shot. <laughs> so if, if the zoning board so didn't grant the appeal, so you have well, to do so, it. So let's, let's no, clarify. They, the they withdrew their request. Right, they withdrew, yeah. right. And, sorry, so I just want to, that's an important fact that we withdrew the request because we, they, the client went to the zoning board at a time when there was no construction financing in place. And the request of the zoning board and I said this in my letter, is very distinct from the request that's before your council, right? The zoning board's request was, we don't even want to put a shovel in the ground. We don't have financing for the whole project. Went to two zoning board meetings that summer, July and August. During that process, a lender stepped up and granted a loan for the entire project. So that's when the request was withdrawn. So the ZBA never had an opportunity to vote up or down on that application. Now fast forward to now, we're not asking to, we don't ever want to start the construction of the commercial. We're just saying we can't finish it quite yet because we don't have a, a, a tenant identified. Therefore, the request is to grant the CEO and the residential. Again, big picture policy. Let's get the residential units online, get the trail open, generate economic, economic activity at the site while we continue to pursue the commercial efforts. Was your client also the builder behind 344 Main Street? Yes. Okay, so uh, that's another, uh, ex sorry, go ahead, Dan. No, go ahead. I was just saying, I mean, that's yet another example of, um, well, I'm just gonna do what I think I wanna do and then wait to get caught. Well, so hang on a second. I'm not um, what do you mean by that? Because uh, as I recall the, the history, this builder was not the original developer or the original owner of 344. That party ran out of dough and sold it. Okay. So a better question would be, is this the same person who didn't follow the plans and built the building out onto the sidewalk at 344? No, not that I believe. Well, okay. my recollection was that the plans were approved for going out into the sidewalk because the property line included some of the sidewalk on the property, and the builder then cut it back at their expense when, uh, as an accommodation, as I recall, and I can certainly verify it, it wasn't that they built onto the sidewalk. The sidewalk was on their property and the plan, and there was not clarity on the plans because the plans provided for them to build out into the sidewalk. Yeah, okay. that was my recollection as well, yeah. that the approved plans by the planning board were in the sidewalk. Yes. And that the new owner uh, ate the cost of moving it back uh, as the new owner. Correct. Our and client, the, old, the old owner is now the developer who's not performing on the Citizens Bank property. So we see, so that, that developer sold to the other one. He's still in town, still creating issues. And I'm sorry, you were saying. No, you're exactly right, right? Our client purchased that property with the approvals in place and built what was approved. But 248 Tyronda. 344. But 248 Tyronda, he hasn't done that. He hasn't what? Um, built as approved because he hasn't right. concurrently built the commercial right. he's been in so, violation so look, he <laughs> was in violation since may of 21 but again when gra when the, when groundbreaking occurred the entire site was being worked on so because of what the approvals provided for because of what the code provided and again our clients wanted the mixed-use project they weren't this wasn't like some bait and switch, they had this great scheme all along to get rid of the commercial to get more residential. They also wanted the commercial. So when the financing came in for the entire project, and the, the letters from the banks, the denial letters from the banks are in your zoning, are in the zoning board's materials, they're before your council, they're, they're on the, in the agenda packet. 
Um, but then a loan came through for the entire project, resi and commercial together. So the client didn't say, you know what, we don't have a commercial tenant, we're gonna hold everything. They still broke ground, complied with the code, complied with the approvals, they did. They started the site work on the entire site. There was, no, no, no. There, there was a, the there was a hole you know in the ground no. and the foundation now exists. So site work had started on the commercial pad. You're shaking your head no, but my, the, the entire site was graded. There was a excavate, it was excavated. The commercial and it's now is supposed foundation. to be done concurrently or done before residential, which is the total opposite of what he's done. I, we're splitting hairs a little bit. No, no I'm not. not. No, no. Your, our <laughs> law specifically I'm says, and for three Concur years you've been in violation of the law. The your client. entire site was worked on. All the site work, the horizontal site work was done at the exact same time. Yes, there was grading that went north to south, but the entire site was worked on. And then when it comes time to go vertical, for the same exact reasons Brian mentioned, on a commercial pad, you don't go vertical until you have a tenant in place. Ceiling heights, how the, where the demise was. That's not what our law says. So, so okay, let me, let me just ask, um, can we deal with the issue at hand, which is, do you want to bring 64 units, including six affordable, online now, or, or not. I, I mean, I don't I think, it, I don't think what it, I don't think, I don't understand what it has to do with the other question because the other question, you're gonna have a full ability to address that when they figure out what are they gonna do with that site. Either they have to build it out or they have to come and ask for a change to residential. Frankly, at this stage, our needs are much more residential. So I, again, I'm trying to understand practically <coughs> what are we trying to accomplish here? Do we want to bring residential units online, including six affordable now, or not? We do not need 54 luxury units right now. Th these aren't luxury units, excuse me, okay? They're what the not market bears in Beacon, all right? You want luxury, go down to New York City. Right? You use that term as if you know, anything more than you know, uh, $1,400 a month is luxury. Let's be real I'm not about using, it. I'm not, you put that word in my mouth. I didn't you, say that. No, you said I luxury. I said luxury because what I know is that all these new things going in, now there's cyber trucks and Lamborghinis everywhere, and we know that people that are moving in are not, it's not in keeping with the class distribution that we've had in Beacon for many years, and we know that. Yeah, and when I moved in, when it was the poorest community in the county, I can assure you that very few people were willing to move to Beacon including most of the people that came in the last 10 years. What required to have to happen was that the mix of the community had to balance out a little bit. And now what you're saying is, well, that's not good enough. Um, in fact, we still have 30% of our rental stock is subsidized. Because it's subsidized, we are always going to have a mix in our community, which is why I moved here in the first place and why I'm here now. If you want to use the banter around the term luxury, let's go define it before we start using it Willy nilly. Are you aware how much affordable. the residential units are going for? I don't. I don't have a, a rental price on those. No. If you want to have not, affordable but, but housing but in the city of Beacon, the way you're going to have to get there is you have to have enough market rate units to support the loss that's involved in having subsidized units. That's how this numbers work. If you want to increase the percentage to 50%, you'll get no construction whatsoever. To get 10%, you need market rate units. That's how the subsidy works. And the builder makes enough on the market rate units to afford the losses associated with the ongoing rental below market of the affordable units. Right? If you don't want the luxuries, we're not going to get anything affordable either. Take your pick. You need to be realistic about basic economics one. This isn't even economics 101. It's just economics one. So we don't have any data. So when we were talking about the uh, rental mix before, so how do you know that it's 90% non-affordable housing that is going to fund 10%? Every zone in the area and every planner says that's the basic plan. We had CPC expert, we had our own experts, we had the county folks come in and say, this is the model that everyone uses. If you'd like to invent another model, show me where it is and let's go through it. But that's the one that's always on the table. If you don't want the market rate units, you will get zero affordable units. It's very basic. All right, it's $300,000 is the number I heard, and that was a few years ago, to build a unit in this area at current costs. 
three hundred thousand dollars at five percent is fifty fifteen thousand a year that's twelve hundred and fifty dollars a month just the interest that doesn't count anything else so if you think that rentals at fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars the tax associated with that is probably another five hundred to a thousand dollars a month just our property taxes so deal with that reality as opposed to just saying I don't have any evidence all right everyone who's come and spoken here has said that's the evidence and you keep saying show me the details it's like if you don't want to rely on the experts go find someone else then that is an expert that can bring forward but that's what they all say every single time and Mayor, you mentioned you mentioned CPC <coughs> they were one of the two folks who I'm gonna ask you to just let me speak for a minute sure thank you I didn't see you were trying to try um, I I want to offer a couple viewpoints of the way I'm thinking about this for the council. I think it's uncomfortable and unfortunate for us to feel like we have to solve a problem that somebody else created. At the same time, I think there are considerations about what is in the benefit of the city that I want to think through. I don't necessarily think leaving those two buildings vacant for a long period of time is beneficial. Empty buildings are um, decomposing buildings. I also know that we can impose conditions upon the applicant for issuing the CO. And so, again, I don't like being in this position. I don't, I, it, is all just feels like a big crap sandwich that we now just have to force down but if I think about what is in the benefit of the city it feels like maybe there are some conditions that we might impose that give us a comfort level I also would say I'm not sure that I don't actually just want to see another residential building so I just offer that perspective and am interested in what other people think. I, I also have been thinking about that, Amber, of what, we, what conditions we can impose, but I, I can't get to that until I understand the, what happened in the last three years. Okay. Um, so has the, has the owner been penalized for the last three years of noncompliance? Is there, I mean, obviously we have penalties when the law isn't followed. Would the attorney been, know that? Because he probably would try to fight that? <laughs> no? Are you asking, have violations been issued? No. No, no, there was I mean, a, there, have, so there was a violation. For three years, we've been, you've been in violation of the law, which says that the t buildings all have to be built concurrently. We'll agree to disagree on that. I, I think what he said mean? there's no violation that's been issued. Okay. Um, so this is a city council meeting where we all talk. <laughs> and you're asking we'll me, let you know if you're asking me a question. I was asking the city attorney whether any violations have been issued. Sorry, last no three. violations have been issued. Okay. And so who would be, what are the penalties for being out of compliance and who should be issuing those penalties? Well, Bruce, the building inspector makes that determination okay. if they're in compliance or not. Okay. I've not had that discussion with him as to whether they're in compliance or not. No, he's. There was a letter. But after the conversation we had about the uh, zoning board piece where they withdrew, we, then we know that they're in violation of the law. So the next step would be to find out how long have they been in violation for the law and what those penalties are, right? Well, the first question is, have they been in violation of the law? That's Bruce's, it was up to the building inspector to make that determination. Right, so the party who makes the determination has not made such a determination yet. Correct. Okay, so I don't think we can conclude that they're in violation of the law. Right, and it's for council count, I can, that's up to the building inspector. Okay. Was that's there, true with any enforcement of the zoning code. Was there a letter by the, from the planning board? Or not the planning board, from the zoning board. The, the building department. Yes, that, that told him to go to the zoning board. Yeah. Yes, there was. It's there in was our packet. Well, it's to the not zoning a board. Well, it a, correct, it wasn't a violation. It was a, he had asked for permission to not comply with that provision, and the building inspector said, I don't have that authority, you have to go to the zoning board. But because he said you have to go to the zoning board, he was recognizing that, he, that there's a law 
that he did not have the authority to go around and that the, an appeal to that law was what was necessary. That was Bruce's determination. No, well, Bruce's, it wasn't Bruce at the time, it was right, so it was the building inspector. Okay. Building inspector's determination at that time was they could not waive the requirement, and this was all before construction had started, they could not waive the requirement to build the residential and not the commercial. That had to go to the ZBA. Therefore, acknowledging that a requirement existed. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yes. Okay. And the question then becomes, was that commitment was that provision of the code followed through on? I can't answer that. The building inspector would have to, as to what is deemed to be the construction. Is, is a condition, is it wrong to say they should, what is built, that the, there should be 20% affordable units instead of 10 So when you pose conditions, there needs to be a nexus between what you're doing and what you're allowing. Here you're being asked to allow for, um, something to be, a CO to be issued before it otherwise would be. I'm not seeing that as a direct connection. You do have that ability with respect to the commercial. request to convert the commercial to residential. There you could put in a higher percentage. Sorry, the law as, as we wrote it yes. said that we could impose conditions, but we, at the time we weren't told that there was a drastic limitation to the, to the conditions. I voted for that law because I thought that we could do exactly as Pam proposed. Well, well okay, the, so why don't we just require them to pay us $10 million? Right, there's always right? been. That just, sounds good. I know, exactly, <laughs> right? But I don't think we can ask for that. Second. No. <laughs> there's, Go back to the budget meeting. Yeah, we've had this discussion, and maybe not with this council, but in the past when we've done our training, when Jennifer Gray has come in, we've spoken not a lot, but on the conditions there needs to be a nexus. Boards just can't impose conditions. There's got to be a nexus to it. I have to say I also would not have passed the law allowing this conversation to happen if I knew that we were so limited in the conditions that we could pose. I'm certainly not saying to be like, Obviously, I know you were being facetious, Pam, $10 million. That would be lovely. But um, the conversation that we had about even allowing this request to come forward gave the council the ability to impose conditions upon the granting of the CO. And we did ask, it, this just was, I, I would not have voted for that law. I would not. Oh, okay. I, I can appreciate after the fact that statement. But again, let's go during the fact. You don't have infinite ability to impose infinite dollar amounts. There are, are reasonable limitations, and the city attorney is merely describing what those are. To say that you had, you had in your head absolutely no restrictions whatsoever, I think is a little unreasonable. Um, and I'm, I, I hear you that it's a, it might be surprising to hear that the way that reasonableness is, ap is applied is this nexus concept. And I can hear that that might be not quite what you had in mind, but I don't think you had no restrictions in mind. I assumed there would be restrictions, but I thought by we could increase the affordable housing component of the two buildings as, uh, as you, know, per, you know, to allow them to go ahead with this. So I, well, alternatively, we could just leave it fallow. You know, I share the interest in getting residential in to meet the need that's there. And so that is a you know contextual balance that I'm that I'm thinking about here. But my concerns are that we're talking about conditions, and one there's a there's a concern about enforcement about current situation being, being what it is from the city's perspective too. The language I've seen when you know we had the conversation last time and talked about good faith, you know, good cause, showing good faith in efforts for commercial. We've heard I think an argument made that there's no basis for this. And it gives me concern in the language I see in the letter, the most recent letter dated November 8th, that conditions imposed in the future would, it would be a challenge to try to enforce them, to make them come to fruition. So it's just, this is my concern. I don't think there's no basis as much as just it's going to take time. It's not something... That's fine, but what I see in the body language, the statements made, and in the letter is are, are there, there seems to be already a mindset to uh, achieve an outcome where there would not be a commercial use of that space. That's, so that's my interpretation. That's my much. interpretation. Thank you very much. And, and look, just to, I, I hear you. That, that's I'm really not interested in the back and forth. I'm just expressing what I observe. Yeah. Thank could you. A, could a condition for a CO be something like the, um, the percentage of affordable units available is X until the time that the commercial space is resolved? 
Is that an appropriate condition? I would, look, that's subject to more consideration. I think that would be because you're tying that to granting the ability for the CO to be issued sooner. You could also require the BMR units be the ones first leased or built out and made available. I was thinking something like that. I didn't say, you know, I was thinking pretty much exactly. The only thing that I'm fearful of is the poor people are in those, right. that other percentage mm -hmm. who now it's going up. Yeah, that's so, a good point. Okay. All right, so if, if that's the line of thinking, what about saying um, half of them come on or the, the below market rate come on and, you know, 60% of the rest and some are held? Would that be a nexus until the, the connection that Amber made, which is until the other item is resolved? Yes, I would say that. Yeah. Say that again, Lee. Well, in other words, not permitting all 64, but saying we'll permit you know X number, uh, and then the remainder will be tied to a resolution on the commercial building. Does it seems that odds with your the concern earlier about getting more housing I, out I, there? But I, again, but I, I'm very clear. I want the housing, right? In fact, if someone said the commercial building would convert to housing, you'd, you'd have me interested as well. I might impose a higher bull market rate can do percentage on it, but I'd be willing for that because that's what we're short of right now. That's kind of where my head is too. That I think there's two different things. Uh, if we were to potentially say that we would you know, give it a little bit more time on the commercial, set some kind of end date, um, and then discuss whether that's residential, and my expectation would be that that residential has more than 10% below market rate. It is in the back of my head. Um, I do think if we are to consider bringing the residential units on, I do agree that the below market rates should be rented first. And only once those are rented out could the other ones be marketed. Um, I agree with putting some cap on the amount. I would still like to actually make more affordable units in that um, and, and tie all of that until such a time when the commercial property is resolved, mm -hmm. which hopefully gives enough incentive to get that figured out immediately. I, for one, would like to hear from the public and uh, specifically from people who live in that area. Yep. Um, so maybe we'll get some, some feedback from the public next week. What I can do is also give some thought as to conditions and, and reach out to some of you individually as well just to um, follow up on that. So uh, let me suggest one to council because Amber's kind of idiating through things and I, I think it's a, it's a good approach. Um, so what would the council think about um, just solve both issues at the same time? Say the commercial piece at their choice, they can complete commercial. If they want to do residential, they can do full residential at 20% below market rate at 70 AMI, and they can bring the 64 online. What would people think about just resolving the whole thing at once? I need to give it some thought. Uh, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to agree to that right now in terms of converting the commercial to residential. Um, but I'm similar to Amber on the CEO issue, the CEO <laughs> issue for the buildings that have been built up. I agree with Molly on both points. Just trying to get it off our table. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying well, to maximize housing. I don't, I don't think we want to get it off our table just yet. Um, the, as far as the uh, enforcement piece, when are we going? When will we get an answer about um, decisions made um, and penalties and all of that kind of thing? I'll have to speak to Bruce, but so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get back to you as soon as I can after I okay. speak to him. Because you know, if the if the residential and the commercial were deemed that they did not have to be built at the same time, then I don't know why we just did this other law about certificates of occupancy. You know. Um, any other thoughts? Are we trying to resolve anything tonight or not? It's a good conversation. Yeah. Would you, would you consider mixed use apartments on the second floor? In that, uh, uh, in that, on the, in the commercial building, yeah, I, I don't have any objection to that. Again, my, again, I just want to be really clear. Housing's my absolute number one. 
right? And so other council members may have other views, but I think the community right now, and I think the metropolitan area, I think the state, and I think the, the country needs uh, residential units right now. So that would be an option, certainly, but I, I'd be perfectly fine with 100% residential, given the affordable percentage uh, to be decided. Right, that it would have to increase slightly in yeah. the units mm -hmm. to yeah. be able to get any condition yes. change to the benefit. I'll also tell you the finance person I spoke to said they love doing 80-20 deals. They do them all day long and they love them. So. Could have done that a few years ago. Sorry, I didn't understand what yeah. was said. 80-20 deals. 20% um, affordable. Uh, with what give back? <laughs> so. It's a commercial financing person said they love doing those types of deals. That's it. I'm just offering a counterpoint that I went and had additional conversations, as you said we should, if we want to gather more information. So I talked to people with over 60 years doing commercial financing. What does anyone want to move forward? I'm happy to move forward. Any other thoughts or are we on hold? I'm ready to go to item number eight. Mayor, we, we would respectfully request a resolution along the lines of what you just suggested. There's seven of us. I'm okay. asking for the council to consider a resolution. The mayor made There's a really nothing to consider because what Nick stated was that he would come back to us with some options for the um, conditions, so you should expect that there would be conditions. I have nothing that I would put forward as a resolution for the public to react to mm -hmm. until Nick gets back to us with the points that we discussed here. And is Nick coming there, and there are seven of us at this table, so everybody else is welcome to an opinion. I'm kind of sick of being so hostile. <laughs> and would those, would those draft conditions be embodied in a draft resolution for the council's consideration at the next meeting? I'm trying to understand the, the, pro, the next step, right? No, All my, yours. I, yeah, no. my understanding is no, that there would be a workshop of, a, of these conditions so that the full council members have the opportunity to weigh in on it. The council is not going to get a resolution with conditions and then discuss it at the meeting they vote on it. Yeah, so that's So it would be I... appropriate to have a draft resolution or a draft set of conditions for the council to determine if they want to proceed to the next step. Yeah. So this has to come back to another workshop. And then, Nick, procedurally, does this require a public hearing? It does not, no. Okay. Yeah, but I... I Although I would like to hear from the public. Yeah, I agree. Nick's interpretation of the council, which I think is where Amber has been speaking, I think represents the majority of the council. Agreed. Right? So that says in two weeks we'll take up additional information, but not a resolution. We'll certainly ask your presence, um, but it's going to take a few rounds is what I'm hearing. And, and hopefully yep. some input from us on the conditions themselves. All right. Okay. Yeah, if you have conditions that you think you would agree to, by all means, we'll provide talk. them to yep. me, yes. Yeah, especially yeah, if they increase the, the affordable housing, as you heard us discuss. I heard the comment. We heard that last time too. I know I heard that last time yes. and we didn't hear that and I didn't read anything in the letter that included that. Okay, good. Um, I appreciate all your time this evening. I appreciate the council's discussion. Uh, and I actually, again, think it was a really, really good discussion that we needed to start to have. So thank you all. Um, good night. Thank good you night. and good night. Uh, and then the last item is the CSEA item, is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you and good night. Chris, um, you're going to tell us about uh, the agreement. Yes. So this was added to the packet last minute because the um, CSEA, which is the Civil Service Employees Association that represents approximately 62 of our workers, had a vote on it. Um, I didn't want to put it on before I knew the outcome of that. They did adopt it. Um, we are currently in a three-year collective bargaining agreement about the terms and conditions and wages for the union. That uh, sunsets at the end of December, so we're um, proposing a new three-year agreement, and I'll walk through a number of the points. Um, I won't go through everyone, and if you have questions, feel free to stop me. Um, the crux of this is the wage increase that I mentioned. Um, we are offering the union three years of increases of 4.5% or alternatively $2,750 depending on where they are in the wage uh, schedule. So basically if you make more than $30 an hour, you'll get a 4.5% raise. If you make less than $30 an hour, 
you will get a higher raise. And what we, we tried to do this with the employee retention bonus that we did in late 2023. Over years, people kept getting raises of percentages. And what it created was a very real disparity in the dollar amounts that they make. And that disparity overwhelmingly cut against um, office workers who are mostly female. And so we're trying to get that disparity in wages fixed and also give people a decent cost of living adjustment to make up for the loss of buying power that they had, particularly in 2021 and 2022. This contract would clean up some of the language, include memorandums of agreement that we've passed since the last collective bargaining agreement, including that employee retention bonus. Um, there, there's some um, language in it about emergency work that we needed to clarify so we, we were clear that we had the right to call people in if there's an emergency. Um, you'll see a change to the sick days at, at, in the current contract. People who accrue sick days at the end of their career can sell back one, they can sell back up to 195 days at half cost. And we have people that have this number of days who have been here 20 or 30 years, they never use a sick day, and, and they are, are saying, well, we, you know, we're the ones that come to work every day and we're only being paid out for half of these days. So what we decided to offer is if someone has more than 100 days on the books, they can sell back 10 days each year. And we also increased the incentive for people not to use more than three sick days we, we currently have a payment of $600. This uh, proposed contract would raise that to 1,000, which is commensurate with what we do with the police and fire. Um, we changed some of the language in it. For instance, our health care has changed from Blue Cross to Anthem, that got changed. Um, we raised the lowest um, paying salary in the, in, the, in the city, which was rec assistant to $20. We really don't feel that it, you can get good workers right now paying less than $20. Um, and, and in fact, that's rare. We're trying to get even higher than that. Um, there, there are some adjustments to calling back employees for meetings. Um, and we did add a pilot program, which I'm interested to see how it works out. In water and sewer and at the wastewater treatment plant, we have people that are um, licensed with kind of esoteric licenses that they don't really train anywhere to do. And what we're trying to do is succession planning by making sure that somebody who, like for instance, our water operator, Matt Feza, can retire anytime. And we don't have the next person ready to go for that position. So what we're proposing is with certain guide rails, we would allow training to be paid for by the city that would go for those specific licensing requirements. It's, it would only be for water and wastewater because uh, the water plant and the wastewater plant both have these uh, challenging licensure issues. Um, and again, it, if somebody doesn't pass the course or somebody leaves, there's a payback provision. Um, so the union um, did adopt this this afternoon uh, we would like to bring it to council uh, so that we can make sure that these increases go into effect January 1. We're, we're in good timing to do that. It gives payroll time to adjust. I will just say that over the last three years, we have had a very good relationship with all of our unions, particularly with CSEA. And we have avoided spending money on frivolous grievances, on disciplinary actions that weren't necessary. Um, and, and really kind of resetting the tone after um, some years of, of acrimony. And um, I, I do think our, our staff deserve this raise. I think they're doing better and more work than they've done in the past. I think we're attracting a, a better qualified, better educated workers. Um, and we'd like to be the employer of choice, not the employer of last choice. And, and staying competitive with others in the area is important. Now some might say, why didn't you do 5%? You just did that for the police. And the context of that is, we did that because the police next year are only getting 25 to 3%. Because we had locked in to another contract um, and we were well behind other departments and we were losing people to other departments. 
we don't have that staffing crisis necessarily, but we're looking ahead at how we continue to build a really strong workforce here. Um, so if, if you have any questions about any of the things I covered or other things in this memorandum of agreement, again, I'm happy to answer that. Um, and I'm sorry we put it in late, but I didn't want to put it in and then have, have something go sideways. Mm -hmm. I mean, it certainly sounds like um, a very positive advancement for the employees. I think their, you know, financial health and enjoying working here is just as important as the financial health and well-being of people who live here. So um, it, it sounds like a really solid contract, and I'm glad to hear that they've approved it. Thank you. Yes, to echo what Amber said, thank you, Chris, for managing this. Um, can you talk through a little bit about the next steps in terms of as they've already signed it? Is this something the council has to approve? Is there a public hearing? Kind of what happens next? The council does need to approve it. So typically when you do um, an MOA with a memorandum of agreement with any of the unions, I sign it on behalf of the city and then the regional and local reps from CSEA sign it. And you'll see in your packet the local reps hadn't signed this because they didn't have the vote yet. So they will execute it. If you um, authorize me to sign it, authorize it next week, it will go into effect. So my signature is, is only saying like we, um, we did do this agreement. Um, it doesn't take effect until you authorize it. And then what we would do is we'd incorporate this MOA into a new CBA, a collective bargaining agreement. So the 60 page contract that they have would include all these changes. And that's when we go back and we clean up some of the language. There were things that were stranded from contracts years ago. There were still straight pronouns that made no sense. Um, so, so again, we'll do some of that cleanup work and um, it would go into effect January 1, 2025 and it would go until December 31st, 2027. Um, my only add is that um, of the items in this year's uh, proposed budget, uh, making room for um, catch-up increases, it was my number one priority, right? And it's an expensive item, uh, and I would continue to prioritize this one, so. Okay. No objections. Okay. Everybody good? Yep. Yes, uh, thank you. Do we announce the next meeting? So it's Monday the 18th at 7. It'll be a regular meeting. It'll be here. Um, are we ready to adjourn? I certainly am. Uh, a motion to yeah. adjourn. So Second. A motion to adjourn. <laughs> so Amber and Pam, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. Good night. Thank you, Aye. Molly. Thanks, Paloma. <laughs> Thank you.